The following is a reflection on the readings for Tuesday of the 31st week of Ordinary Time. The first reading is taken from Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11. The responsorial is Psalm 22 and the Gospel is Luke chapter 14 verses 15 to 24. One must understand today's first reading in the context of the whole letter which is addressed to the community at Philippi. The city of Philippi was culturally diverse, being a major trade center connecting the west and the east. It contained a predominantly pagan population of Romans, Greeks, and Asians with their diversity of gods, and with a very few Jews, not enough even to have a synagogue. The church would therefore also have been diverse in ethnicity, with all the challenges that that presents. Given this dynamic, Paul sets out to emphasize unity in love. In chapter 1, he thanked the believers for their fellowship in the gospel and encouraged them that God who began a good work in their lives would carry it out to completion in Christ Jesus. A favorite term Paul used throughout the letter is, quote, having the same mind, repeated ten times. The first use of this phrase reveals its meaning, quote, Stand firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Chapter 1, verse 27. In other words, oneness has to do with unity in the spirit, nourished by the gospel. Thus, it is not merely intellectual, based on secular ideas or cultural shifts, but is grounded in a common Christian vision, being of one accord. In chapter 2, verse 3, Paul sets out the two vices that would destroy this unity, selfish ambition and vain conceit. With the diversity of cultures, values, and religions existing within the city, Paul knew that his church could only succeed in evangelizing the population by being completely countercultural. Aware of the effects of original sin and the ever-present danger of evil from a malevolent adversary, Paul sets forth the spark that would ignite a revolution. To counter the two potential vices that could demolish a church and city, Paul once again encourages being like-minded, this time specifically, quote, in lowliness of mind, esteeming others better than yourselves, looking out for the interests of others. The reason this is deeply countercultural is because of the dominant Roman Empire and its attitude toward love of honor, reputation, and status coming out of a Greco-Roman ethic. Humility in this ethic was viewed as a shameful lowering of oneself that signaled weakness. With this introduction, Paul, in today's first reading, illustrates the greatest example of humility and abasement ever shown to the world. Quote, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. End of quote. Notice St. Paul begins by repeating his favorite term, Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. End of quote. In other words, the virtue of humility that Christ is and exemplifies in his incarnation, passion, and death, must be instantiated in our lives. Paul sets forth this humility by giving us a panoramic view of the grand movement of the Son of God from heaven to earth and back to the Father, that is, from his pre-existence before all time with the Blessed Trinity, his long descent in the incarnation, his earthly ministry, his passion and death, all in obedience to the Father. What begins the entire movement is an amazing love that was poured out for our salvation when we were enemies, when we were dead in our sins. 
a love that did not cling to the prerogatives of divinity, but emptied itself of all glory and majesty for the sake of you and I. In contrast to Adam and Eve and their grasp to be like God, Christ assumed the form of a slave, coming in humility, not to be served, but to serve, not to dominate or control, but to draw us in through a life of self-giving, compassion and mercy, seeking out the despised and rejected, then through his healing touch and word, restoring that which was lost. This movement of Christ descends to the indignity of a criminal's death on the cross that would be considered a shameful humiliation in the proud Roman society that exalted the emperor as a god, paying in full the debt we incurred by our sins and winning for us the triumph of the empty tomb, transforming death from the final humiliation into the beginning of something great and sacred. Because of this, Jesus in his human nature is then lifted up and exalted, given a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. The fourth suffering servant, Song of Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 13, is fulfilled. Quote, Behold, my servant shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. End of quote. Paul is also referring to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23, where God says of himself, quote, By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear. They will say of me, in the Lord alone are righteousness and strength. End of quote. Paul is stating that, as creator of the heavens and the earth, and only God, Jesus Christ is Lord, the divine name, Yahweh, to the glory of the Father. This passage in Philippians chapter 2 is a magnificent proclamation, and the key really lies in the first verse. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Here is our call to imitation, beginning in our baptism, where we share the same downward and upward movement in and with Christ. As St. Paul states in Romans chapter 6, quote, Anyone who has been baptized into Christ has been baptized into his death and has been buried with him, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. End of quote. In other words, the abundant life we are called to is the daily dying and rising in and with Christ, dying first of all to sin by turning more and more to the grace won for us by Christ's passion, death, and resurrection, then dying to ourselves and to our own selfishness, prejudice, and jealousy, having the same attitude and love and compassion of Christ where we reach out to heal the hurting and comfort the despairing. To the extent that we do this, we rise with Christ sharing in the fullness of life God intended for us, a fullness that is just beginning and will open up in ever greater degrees throughout eternity, which can only be described using the words of Scripture. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 Applied concretely to our lives with family, work, church, and community, one can ask, how would these relationships change if we truly imitated Jesus Christ, if we had this mind to humbly consider others better than ourselves, considering their difficulties as if they were our difficulties? How would the world react if we started to live this way? In the Roman Empire, the early church had a tremendous impact precisely because people were attracted to something they had never seen before. The Sermon on the Mount lived out. Paul's challenge, laid out in Philippians chapter 2, can only be met with the help of God's grace and a consistent meditation on these verses so that they become our lifeblood. Since it means a reversal of our fallen inclinations we should not be distressed when we fail time and again to attain the goal. 
Rather, with patience and constant access to the sacraments, we progress step by step, carrying our cross and having hope that God who began a good work in us will bring it to completion in Christ Jesus. Given the state of our world with its many divisions, factions, and violence, how can we not make Paul's hymn in Philippians chapter 2 our own, not just individually, but in our parishes as their primary mission statement? Let us call upon the Lord to change our hearts and minds so that we continue to witness the life of Christ by our humility, love, and service in the power of the Spirit. Let us pray. Grant, O God, that we may always revere and love your holy name, for you never deprive of your guidance those you set firm on the foundation of your love. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.